Okay, well, it's good to be back with you again, opening up the scriptures. And um, as we pick up where we left off, in the letter to the Corinthians, the second letter, which, which is really kind of the third letter that Paul wrote, but at the second letter, as we have in the canon of scripture, you might remember where we left off, we were confronted with a real challenge. And that challenge was that all or, or every believer will stand before the Lord one day at what we call the judgment seat of Christ or the beamer seat. We discussed what that was. It's not a judgment for our sin because our, all our sin, past, present and future sin, has been dealt with at the cross. Okay? And this is a sobering thought, the fact that we're going to stand individually before the Lord, because this is when every believer will be rewarded accordingly for both the good and the worthless things that we have engaged our time in. That's sobering. So this future event, can I suggest... The judgment seat of Christ should be like a compass that steers us and guides us on a God-honoring life course as we spend our time down here. And so just hang that in your minds as we open the scriptures and now read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and we'll pick up where we left off and we'll begin at verse 11. Keeping in mind that, hey, the beamer seat, the judgment seat of Christ is something that every true born-again believer is going to have before him one day. Verse 11, therefore, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 11, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest to God, and I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. Remember, he's speaking to the Corinthian church here, right? He's speaking to professing believers. Paul goes on to say in verse 12, We are not again commending ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us so that you will have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. Verse 13, For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that they might live... So they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. May God add a blessing to his word this morning. And so here we have just come out of a situation or a description of what Paul calls the every believer will come to in the judgment seat of Christ. And can I say that this future event for everyone here who is a believer this morning, it should be like a ballast in a ship. You know what a ballast is? You know, coming from a bit of a marine background myself, it's that stuff that you put in the bottom of the ship that holds it on an even keel. So it doesn't sort of go like that too much or helps it. And um, it, this is what this judgment seat, this future judgment seat should be like for us as we make our way through life and all its ups and downs and all its choices and all its decisions, we must keep before us this future event. But knowing about this divine appointment that we, will all, ha we all have, it doesn't make it any easier to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord, right? It doesn't make it any easier. You know, a life lived for the Lord is demanding. I don't have to tell you this. It's costly, it requires personal sacrifice and discipline to reach for the goal, as Paul describes it, the goal of the prize of the upward call of God. It's costly, it's difficult, it's hard. So how do we continue this challenging occupation? This, as Paul describes again, this race that is set before us. How do we continue in this knowing that one day our lives will be minutely, our lives as believers will be minutely examined by the creator of the universe? How do we do that? You know, Paul was confronted with this ongoing and uh, demanding challenge. As a minister of the gospel and as an apostle of God, he, he was confronted with it. He knew all about the difficulties and the demands and the, and the cost. 
And as we think about this epistle that Paul wrote here, uh, it's, it's really all about him doing the hard yard in pastoral ministry, isn't it? This is what this second epistle is about. He, he was dealing with difficult people who should have known a whole lot better. And as a result, the Apostle Paul experienced immense mental and even physical pressure from these doubting and troublesome people whom he ministered to. He did. And here in Corinth was one church, and we've been through the first epistle, now we're in the second. Here was one church that Paul, even though it's the difficult, is, he especially loved. Okay, He especially loved, yet he gave his all to them. He gave these doubting, troublesome people his all, even amid so much grief and turmoil of heart. Why was that? Why was that? Why did they give him so much grief and turmoil? You see, what was going down, and we have been into this in some detail before, creep, had, what, who had crept into this Corinthian church that Paul, by the way, had planted and established and initially spent 18 months teaching and training and nurturing? What had crept in was false teachers. Those who believed in another gospel. We believe Jews from, from Jerusalem and Judah had come up and were trying to and were perpetrating the church and, and were trying to seduce these believers and succeeded in doing so on a number of occasions with a number of these believers. And as a result, some of the Corinthians in the church accused the Apostle Paul of being a fraud and they doubted God's authority that was stamped on the Apostle and they questioned his integrity and his credibility as a minister of the gospel. That's what was happening. So what was Paul going to do? What was he going to do about the situation? He was like a rock in a hard place. You see, because if he defends himself... Against this false accusation, it might come across as prideful and, and self-aggrandizing. But if he, if he didn't defend himself, the believers might be completely sucked into these, this destructive teaching of the false teachers that were in Corinth and reject the gospel, reject the truth of Jesus Christ. So Paul chose above all else, as I might say, as every true born-again believer should choose, no matter what. He chose, he made it his goal to be pleasing to the Lord. We see that in verse 9 of your text. He chose to be pleasing to the Lord. And this involved him defending his ministry, defending himself, defending the gospel of God that he was specifically instructed to teach. You see, so much of the gospel ministry at this stage in the history of the church was at stake here, folks. So much was at stake. And Paul chose to put himself on the line, as it were, in order to please the Lord and to defend the veracity, the truth, the integrity of the gospel, no matter what. That's what he chose to do. Now, what made Paul make this difficult stand or take this difficult stand? You know, why did he bother? Why did he take the time to move against this persuasive false teaching that was in Corinth? What drove him to such lengths? Let me ask, what makes any believer, what makes you and I move in any direction that pleases the Lord? Which may cost us heaps, it may even cost us our life. What makes us move? The answer is simply motivation. Motivation, you get that? This is not a motivational pep talk, don't believe in it. But there is such a thing as motivation. Folks, I can know a great deal about the Christian life, and so can you. We can know the true purpose for our lives. We all know that, is to please the Lord. We can even know that by faith, what it is to please the Lord. Yet confronted with the fear of man, maybe the comforts of life, confronted with the pleasures of sin, and, and the ease that we have of justifying such selfish behavior. You know, when all that comes upon us, we too can often grieve and disobey the Lord rather than please Him, right? 
You see, when we swing in the balance between truth and error and good and evil, what will keep us on the right course that pleases God? What is it? Simply this, folks. It's all about our motivation. You got that? It's all about our motivation. So the question is this. If you are going to follow and serve the Lord, ask yourself, if, am I, if I'm going to follow and serve the Lord, what will sustain me over the long haul and keep me from indifference and keep me from throwing in the towel and walking away from the Lord and, and, and spiritual things and the church, which many Christians or professing Christians do? What's going to keep me from that? Well, I believe the Apostle Paul addresses this very issue in verses 11 to 15. He identifies three great motivating influences that held him on a true course. The first is motivated by the fear of the Lord. He had a healthy fear of the Lord. Now, when we think of fear, we often associate it with the negative. But the fear of the Lord is not a bad thing, you know. It's not a bad thing. Often as a young fellow, I was motivated by the fear of my father's strict disciplinary measures. There's no doubt many of you were as well. That's one kind of fear. But the fear of the Lord is all about something else. It's all about awe and respect and adoration, can we say. This, this kind of fear is similar to what a loyal subject will have for their reigning monarch. You get the picture? And when this kind of fear is in place towards the Lord, the outcome will be this. It will be one of reverence and one of serving and one of worshipfully, obey, worshipfully obeying the Lord. That's what it'll be. Now, this is not about being terrified. No, it's a fear of of grieving and hurting a gracious, loving, merciful, holy, and a righteous God. That's what it is. G. Campbell Morgan once described fearing the God like this. Once we had a fear that he would hurt us. But now we should fear lest we hurt him. You get the picture? You show me a person who is indifferent and casual and loose about the Lord and his word. And that will be a person who lacks a right fear of God. Paul was motivated by a healthy fear of the Lord. And the thought of anyone maligning the ministry and maligning God's gospel. To Paul, that was a slight against a holy and merciful and a just God. So in that, he was motivated to defend himself and the ministry that God gave him to preach and teach. He was motivated to defend the gospel. He was motivated to live out what he preached. He was motivated to live in such a way in the fear of the Lord so that his God-fearing lifestyle and his spoken word would do what? What would it do? That it would, see here, it would persuade men. Okay? So he was motivated in the fear of the Lord so that it would persuade men. In other words, that would influence these Corinthians specifically for good. Okay? I know that we, have, we can think of a general persuasion that our God-honoring lifestyle can persuade men and women evangelistically. But in the context of this, Paul is not speaking evangelistically. He is speaking about these believers or professing believers at Corinth. Because these are the folk who were, who were at odds with the truth of God through Paul and were maligning Paul personally in his ministry. So Paul's passion here in verse 9 is to what? It is to please the Lord because he knows what? That one day he will appear before the judgment seat of Christ, verse 10. And as a result of that, he had a healthy fear of the Lord, verse 11. You get the picture? But now we need to ask, what does that fear really look like? Words are one thing, but action's another, right? What does that fear really look like? What kind of legs does it have in the everyday world? Well, it's plainly seen by God. We see that in our text. He says, we are made manifest to God. You see that? Nothing hid from God. 
even our every thought is, is, is exposed and made and known to God. So he says we are made manifest to God, but we also but it also must be humanly seen humanly and tangibly because it can be seen by someone else. You see that at the end of verse eleven. In other words, what Paul is saying here is that Paul's that his God fearing lifestyle is seen by God, it will also hopefully embed itself in the consciences of those who were against him. You know what it's like. You see someone walking rightly before the Lord and you see, and you yourself may be not quite so right before the Lord and maybe some specific area. And that person's godly, God-fearing lifestyle embeds itself in your conscience and convicts you. That's how the Lord works. Okay, That's how the Spirit of God works. He often uses other people to prick our conscience so that we will not grieve him. This is what Paul was hoping here. Paul's fear of the Lord, it so motivated him that he lived out what he believed, no matter what or who was against him. Let's ask ourselves a question here, by way of application at this point. Does a healthy fear of the Lord motivate you? Does it motivate me? As it did Paul. It should do, and it needs to, folks. It really does. We live in a culture, and even say a Christian culture, where fear of the Lord is not known. We're casual, we're often loose, we're flippant. Even the way we speak of and address the Lord has fallen on a hard time, sad to say. May it never be so amongst us. You know, the fear of the Lord, as I said, it's not something that brings unease and terrifies people. And so may we be like the church in Acts 9. Remember Acts 9, chapter 31, this is what it says. This church, it says, who had peace. There you are, that, that, that rules out the fact that fearing the Lord is all about terror and unease. Let me continue with the verse. Who had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. And now there's a church that walked in the fear of the Lord. They had peace, they had comfort, and they progressed, they multiplied. May we be more like that. Second motivation, this is Paul was motivated by a heart for the church. We see this in verses 12 and 13. A guy named Dan Kimball wrote a book back in 2007 titled They Like Jesus But Not the Church. You may have read it. Now, I'm not recommending this author or recommending the thrust of this book. I want to merely borrow and use the title to describe, sadly, a consolidating trend among many professing Christians today. And what I mean by this is the local church in so many ways is a merely a secondary priority in their lives. There is a lack of heart for the church in many believers today, sad to say. There is this, I love Jesus, yes, I'm a Christian, yes, but I'm not so much in love with the church mentality going on. That philosophy, that way of thinking has seduced many in our day. And there is much technology that has encouraged that. You don't need to go to church. You don't need to come together with saints. You can sit home and you can go on the net and you can look at whatever famous preacher or whatever you want. You can listen to his message and justify and satisfy yourself. Oh, I've heard the word of God. Ah, there's many ways that can happen. And, and, and as a result, I love Jesus, yeah, but not so much the church. And so as a result, we see professing Christians treating the fellowship of believers, the local fellowship of believers, uh, whether it be in our times of worship or our times of prayer meeting or, or, or the, treating the fellowship of believers by edifying one another, even treating the Lord's Day as if it was no different than any other day. We see professing believers skip Sunday worship at the drop of a hat. Oh, my family are coming. Oh, I've got a birthday party to prepare for or a sporting match to attend. You can have, add stacks of other reasons. There seems to be an increasing amount of that sort of thing. 
Am I right in this or not? Maybe it's my imagination. I don't think so. This lack of love and loyalty to the local church is real. And I might say it's a blight on the testimony and spiritual growth of any local gathering. Now what can we learn from Paul on this issue? About loving the church or having a heart for the church. I think he says plenty about it and we have it in our text. We need to understand here that Paul did not want to brag about his spiritual achievements, right? This has come up before and it's come up again. He's not wanting to commend himself. He's not wanting to say, hey, look, this is what I did, this is what I am, this is what I'm doing, uh, in order to win the love and the admiration of the saints at Corinth. He wasn't want to do that. Matter of fact, his only boast was, we read it in 1 Corinthians 1.31 and again in chapter 10 of this letter, in verse 17, he says, Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. He didn't boast in his achievements or his ministry successes or what he was, and etc. He didn't boast in religion. His only boast was in Jesus Christ and him alone. As a matter of fact, the only thing that he boasted in himself personally was in his weakness. We see that in chapter 11, verse 30. When we acknowledge and understand that we are weak in and of ourselves, it's then that the Lord will use us and can use us. So his reason for defending himself here in our text was so that the believers at Corinth, though they were vacillating and indecisive about Paul's credibility... It was so that they might be proud of him, our text says. Now, don't get the idea that this word proud is a bad word. What it kind of means here is that they would be assured and affirmed and be certain that Paul was the real deal and his message was the true message from God. And so they might be uh, have ammunition in themselves, with themselves, to refute the false teachers who were causing so much hack, uh, havoc among them. You see, Paul... Paul had a heart for the church. He wanted to see the saints built up from A to B to C to D so that they could go out, they could be witnesses, they could do what he was doing now. You see, Paul loved the church, folks. He really loved the church. He wanted to see the believers' hearts changed and affirmed and consolidated in the truth of the word of God. Is that what you want? I say before the Lord, that's what I want here. Paul wanted them to gain some spiritual backbone and, and to hold to the truth. That's what he wanted. He didn't want them enticed further and further away by these false teachers, no. You see, these guys were the peddlers, they were hucksters, and uh, they only cared about external religious practices and, they, and about themselves. As we've looked at before, and this is what Paul means by external, uh, external and appearance and not in heart. They only looked at the external recommendations, seminary degrees, oratory skill. They only cared about so-called being successful as viewed by men. They were not concerned about the spiritual growth of changed hearts. That's what we want, right? I don't care how many times people come to church or go through the necessaries and all the externals, but unless there's a change of heart, that's what really matters, right? Of course, we know that there's a, the big change of heart must come from when a sinner repents of a sin and comes to Christ. They have a new heart, but even our new hearts can be hindered by the flesh and by our persuasions here and there. And so our hearts must be transformed. We must be transformed daily. Romans chapter 1, 12, verse 1 and 2. Be transformed by what? By the renewing of your mind. That's what Paul wanted. Is that what you want? Not only for yourself, but for others in this church. You should do. You should do. So to Paul, Paul defends the Corinthians. Why? So that they might have the ammunition, as I said before, to refute these hucksters and glory in the truth that Paul passed on to them. See, so Paul loved the church. He had a heart for the church. He even stated in chapter 12, verse 15 of this letter, this is what he said, I will most gladly spend and be expended for your souls. Then he asked this question, If I love you more, Am I to be loved less? 
The easiest thing in the world would be to walk away and let these difficult people stew in their own juice, right? Not my business, not my problem. Let them deal with it. Why bother with these hard-headed, recalcitrant doubters? Why bother? But Paul is motivated by a fear of the Lord and a heart for the local church. Folks, Paul does not leave the church in the lurch. He doesn't. Then Paul says, if we are beside ourselves, in verse 13, if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. What does he mean by this? In other words, what he says is, if we do appear to some as having lost our minds, because that's the word means there, lost our minds, out of our minds, don't be too negative on that, because remember, the same word is used of Jesus' own family in the book of Mark chapter 3 where he was in the house preaching with crowds and crowds of people. He had performed many miracles, and here he was. There was crowds of people trying to come in and get an ear shot or a miracle performed or whatever, and his family came to try and rescue him from that, and their decision was he's out of his mind. Same word. So some were considering Paul to be out of his mind. And then he goes on to say, or if you have, he says to the Corinthians, or if you have considered us sane and normal, let this be to your spiritual benefit. What he meant by that, either way, whatever people think is not the issue. Bringing glory to God through your lives in the church is absolutely paramount. That's what was important to Paul. You see, folks, Paul was motivated by a passionate heart for the local assembly. Let me ask again, if I may. How much does the Lord's Church here at New Community motivate you? Have you got a passionate heart for its function, its purpose, its unity, its leadership, its future? Let me put it plain. It's an oxymoron. It's self-contradictory to confess to love Jesus or to be a Bible-believing Christian and to be uncaring, indifferent, or even casual about the local church. You got that? It doesn't stack up. If you are not motivated by a heart for the local church, let me tell you, you will lack the drive, you will lack the wherewithal, to stay the course and to cut a straight path in your worship and service to the Lord. You will fall and break down somewhere along the line. Thirdly, another motivation, motivated by the love of Jesus Christ. We see this very clearly in verses 14 and 15. We often think that it's our love for Christ that is the, the bedrock of our drive to serve and follow the Saviour, right? We often think that. And it is true, by the way, it is true. The measure of our devotion and love for Jesus Christ will determine the level of our attitude and service toward him. That is very true. But here in our text it states that it was, Paul, it was Christ's love for Paul. You see that? Christ's love for Paul that controlled or, or motivated or, or drove him to serve the master. Now, the word controls or constrained, as we have in the King James Version, it carries the idea of holding together for a task ahead. That's what it has in the Greek. That's what it means. And the same word, by the way, is used of Jesus in Luke chapter 12 and verse 50. You remember prior to his death at Calvary, and Jesus said to his disciples, I have a baptism to, be baptized, to undergo, and how, here's the word, the same word as constrained, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Same word there. In other words, the Lord was held together, he did not fall apart as he approached the cross. Even though he was under immense pressure. And it was the same for the Apostle Paul. The love of Christ toward him held him together. It motivated him to complete the task no matter what men would say or do or anything else. It was Christ's love that became the very pressure on him that produced an all-compelling, selfless, 
life of service on Paul's part. That's what it was. Of course, Paul loved Christ and was willing to die for him, and he did, by the way. As history records, all the other apostles as well. Of course, Paul loved Christ. But it was Christ's love for him that overwhelmed and motivated him to respond in loving obedience. You got that? Folks, Paul clearly understood that he deserved, this is in the big picture here, he deserved hell, but Jesus Christ gave him heaven. He understood that. Paul understood that Christ died for all, which included himself and every other single believer. That's what it means in the context here. Christ died for all. He also understood that along with every true believer, he spiritually died. That is the old Saul of Tarsus, as you'll remember the story of his conversion. The old Saul of Tarsus was now done away with. He was born again. He he was transformed. He had a new heart. He was renewed within. He was in Christ. He understood that. Do you understand that as a Christian? You see, folks, when Christ died on the cross as a willing substitute for Paul, as a once forever payment for his sin, when Paul believed and trusted in that, he became a brand new person. Have you become a brand new person by believing in the gospel? Because that's what it is. And this is the same for us, every one of us, as believers. Folks, oh, how Christ loved us. Oh, how he loved us. And with Paul, every believer is now identified with Christ in what? In his death, in his burial, and praise God, in his resurrection. Because we've been given eternal life. Amen? Amen. If anyone, we have this later on in in our chapter in verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. In other words, every true believer is now one with Christ. If you've got that word, one with Christ. We're not attached to him. We're not someone down here. We are one with him. All the righteousness of Christ, we have been clothed with. God doesn't look upon you as a patched up old sinner. He looks upon you as a true believer, as one with him. Oh, how he loved us. Oh, how he loved us. We belong to the Lord, folks. And now his love toward us should hold us together. Amen? It should hold us together. It should motivate us because, as we have in 1 John 4.19, he first loved us. John tells us again in 1 John 14, and this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. In other words, the Lord Jesus satisfied God's wrath against our sin by dying in our place. Oh, how he loved us. He loved us to death, literally. He loved us like this to set us free from the bondage of sin and eternal death. He loved us like this so that we might not live for ourselves anymore, but for him who died and rose again on our behalf. Dear fellow saints, and I ask myself this question, what motivates you? What motivates you? Is it Christ's love, which is superabounding and never-ending? Romans 8, chapter 39, another reminder. Nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. May we learn to fear the Lord. Right? May we learn and grow to have a heart for the church. And may we be more and more captivated and motivated by the love of Christ toward us. Now let me finish with this. Maybe you are not a believer here this morning. Maybe you're a religious person. Yet you personally know nothing of the love of Christ in your life. Maybe that's the case. Maybe you can even call yourself a Christian and you know about Christ's love but have never experienced it personally through saving faith. Maybe that's where you are this morning. My dear friend, your eternal destiny is at stake if you reject 
and spurn the love of God and through Jesus Christ for salvation. You are in peril if you have never experienced the love of Christ through faith and salvation. Let me leave this well-known but vital truth with you so that this morning, right where you are, you can respond in repentance and faith toward the Christ who loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have a lasting life. Oh, how he loves us. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven this morning, we've been reminded powerfully of your faithfulness toward us. And as we think of that faithfulness, we're reminded of the Old Testament promises of how the Messiah would come. And sure enough, the Gospels give witness that the Lord Jesus came. But not only did he come, he proved himself as to who he was, a very God and very man. But more than that, he, he went all the way to the cross. And so, Lord, we just give you thanks for that because... There was no sin in him, and because of that, you raised him from the dead. But in dying, he paid for our sins. And so, Lord, we go free. And we trust now in a risen Savior, a one who is in glory and coming again. And so, Father, help us to grasp these promises. Help us to be motivated by a right fear of the Lord a love for one another in the church and the church itself. And Father, to be motivated by your love for us. Help us in this, we pray. Take us from this place in safety. Watch over us during the week. And Lord, help us to stand firm for you. Firm in the faith of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And all the people of God said, Amen.